I'm Peter Randall Page, I'm a sculptor and we're in my studio here in Devon on the edge of Dartmoor. Um, there are actually several studio spaces here. This is where I tend to do the, the larger work that's more dusty and uh, more, a little bit more industrial, I suppose. It's very good for stone carving because it's open and the dust blows away and uh, also I can get fairly big things in and out of here reasonably easily, although the Devon lanes are always a problem and you need brave crane drivers and lorry drivers to come down here. I was an only child and I spent a lot of time on my own uh, looking at um, natural phenomena. I was one of those kids that went around collecting fossils and picking up things and making collections of natural objects. My father was a commercial artist, a model maker really, so I grew up with uh, a father who was working in the garden shed making things as a way of making a living. So it always seemed completely natural to me that one could uh, have a career by making things. I went to art college in the 1970s. It was pretty clear even before I went to art college that sculpture was what I was interested in. I think I've always been, my work's always been kind of informed and inspired by a study of natural phenomena of various kinds, um, right from childhood, really. And I think uh, beginning to notice as I got more interested in, in looking at things, looking at things through microscopes and, 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 you know, the other end of the scale through telescopes, is how certain kinds of shapes and forms seem to reoccur in completely disparate context so you've got something like the hexagonal packing of a honeycomb and then you've got the hexagonal packing of something like basalt when it cools now those two things uh, couldn't be more opposite in the, the way of the processes that have formed them and yet one has a very similar uh, kinds of um, geometry going on the same with the spirals you see in the movements of water or the galaxies or snail shells and that kind of thing so i began to become interested in in the kind of vocabulary that underpins um, what we see around us in the natural world. And that's been an enduring interest, really, just um, trying to understand uh, really what underlies and causes uh, the forms that we see in nature. I think the interest in stone in particular started to develop towards the end of my time at, uh, at college. I kind of like the simplicity of the process, the fact that it's uh, conceptually a very simple idea. You remove the material you don't want and leave the bits you do want. One of the things that becomes apparent when you do look at natural phenomena uh, over a long period of time is that there seems to be a kind of dynamic tension going on. And this is not only in organic form, it's inorganic things as well. There's a, there's a ubiquitous kind of tendency for spontaneous pattern formation, which we see all around us, um, uh, even in the sort of sand dunes and, and all sorts, ev every kind of phenomena. But at the same time, there seems to be an equally strong tendency for random variation. So no two oak leaves are exactly the same, no two um, potatoes or pebbles or human faces are exactly the same. And in a way, one can see this kind of tension between the tendency to order and the tendency to randomness actually as driving the evolutionary process itself. If you, if you only had order and no random variation, uh, nothing would change, nothing would evolve. Um, if you only had random variation and chaos, well, it's hard to imagine what, what that universe would, would feel like. So over the years, I've become interested in not so much looking at specific objects in nature and, and working from them, but actually trying to get underneath the skin of what's going on, if you like, and, and trying to devise ways of working which combine um, a, a, an ordering principle, which often grows from uh, mathematics and geometry, which after all is the study of patterns. Mathematics really is the study of patterns. Uh, and also um, includes some random element that I'm not in control of and somehow trying to work in the space between those two polarities in a spirit of improvisation. And, and for me, that's very important. And actually, a lot of the ways that I work is an attempt to create a, a space, if you like, where I can play and invent uh, and improvise. Mm -hmm.
I like working with lots of different materials. I mean, I think the thing about stone is that it's, uh, it's just stuff. It's quintessentially stuff. It's what the Earth's made of. And it is, in a sense, it's dumb matter. Uh, and I, uh, I wouldn't want to work, for example, with wood uh, because it's already got its own organic structure to it. It's already got its own kind of um, uh, growth patterns it, within it. Uh, the thing that interests me about stone, particularly igneous rock like granite, um, is that it is what we consider to be ultimately dead stuff. Um, and uh, I quite like the idea of trying to breathe human meaning into this dumb stuff. We all do it in the way we make narratives about our life. We all create these kind of narratives, which to some extent are kind of fictional, but they give our lives meaning. And uh, I'm interested in, in how human beings try and find meaning in things which essentially don't really have any meaning for us. I'm using a thing called a bush hammer, uh, which basically is like a bit like a meat tenderizer, really, and it, it abrades the surface away. Um, so it's not like uh, you think of carving using a chisel where you're cutting into the material. This is a kind of controlled erosion, really, um, and I like that way of working very much. Carving stone is a very useful way of working in common with, with some other ways of working, like drawing, for example, um, because it allows one to be engaged with, a, with an activity your body is busy. You know, a lot of people find it easier to think when they're going for a walk than they do just sitting down trying to think. And there's something about one's body being engaged in some really quite mundane physical activity, in this case, chip, chip, chip. Uh, and it, it can allow the process of making a decision about the form, uh, responding to that, making another decision, acting on that. That can happen in quite an unselfconscious way when the body is busy with an activity like that. I'm not terribly keen on um, having to read an awful lot about a piece of artwork before you can appreciate it. I mean, it's a visual and tactile form. And, uh, you know, I think it's very sad these days that when you ask people about the visual arts, they often say, well, I couldn't possibly say anything about it because I've not been educated to understand the visual arts. People don't tend to say that about music, for example. They tend to feel quite happy about having an opinion. I like that, I don't like that. Um, and I think that's very sad. I don't think one should have to have any qualifications for enjoying the visual arts other than being a human being. People quite understandably do think that there's a kind of um, naivety about working with stone, perhaps because it's something which is a kind of archaic way of working. And, uh, you know, that it's really, um, it's really easy uh, to, to not uh, see that actually working stone can have uh, a, a really important relevance now. Because I don't think human beings have actually changed very much in the last 10,000 years. Um, I think we still feel uh, uh, the same kind of things. Um, and I think the physicality of, um, of making objects uh, does, have a, does have a place. And I think, you know, we, there's a lot of talk about what a visual culture we are now. And we are a visual culture, of course. But it tends to be two-dimensionally visual. Um, and, uh, you know, there's something extraordinary about the solidity of a stone. You know, the things we deal with in our lives tend to be hollow things, houses, wardrobes, furniture, cars, boats. The things we make are basically kind of boxes. And there is something rather extraordinary and uh, slightly um, disturbing almost about drawing one's imagination into the interior of something which is absolutely solid and, uh, you know, and goes all the way through. And of course, you know, the world we live on is that as well. <laughs>